Assalamu alaikum students. So we carry on circulation uh, and today's topic is uh, a chapter in Guyton labeled as local and humoral control of tissue blood flow. Basically we'll be talking about uh, the blood flow at the level of tissues and how it's uh, regulated uh, using various physiological mechanisms. Inshallah. So what is the importance here? What are we talking about and why are we talking about this? So as we know that there are various organs in the body, okay? And uh, there is no uniform blood flow. We have, we've discussed this, uh, that circulation is arranged in parallel, the heart being arranged in series. So circulation being arranged in parallel means that every organ gets to choose how much blood flow uh, it it receives, and this is based on various uh, various things which we'll discuss. But first, let's see uh, uh, this different blood flow thing. So this is an interesting example that lungs they accommodate the entire entire cardiac output uh, per minute or whatever of the of the heart. So uh, there is an extremely large flow of blood through the lungs all the time and it's the requirement because it, it needs the blood needs to be oxygenated so obviously uh, uh, there are other examples like GIT kidneys skeletal muscles which uh, take up 25 percent of cardiac output each so again this is a this is a rather high blood flow uh, uh, through these tissues and uh, this is according to their function so the point here is various organs have various blood flows. So blood flow as, as, as an event, as, uh, as a sequence, need, as a process, needs to be understood properly in the context of various organs. So that's why the word local comes in, local blood flow. By local blood flow, we mean that blood flow through organs locally. Um, and and how come this there is difference in these blood flow? Well, there there is the vascular resistance uh, in various tissues, which is different. So you would expect the lung vascular resistance to be low, okay, because it needs to have high blood flow, okay. And then there is that very big thing which we'll be discussing over and over again later on in the lecture is the tissue need. Basically, the tissue need. Uh, dictates in most uh, cases how much blood will flow through this organ. So uh, an overall uh, sort of view of the mechanisms uh, timeline wise and broad uh, process wise. This is a good slide to give you a, a map of what uh, will happen in the rest of the lecture. So local uh, factors which control blood flow can be divided into two long and long term i beg your pardon acute and long term by acute here we mean seconds to minutes and this is again as always uh, any change in blood flow can be affected by uh, changing the diameter of the vessel if you constrict it then obviously you are decreasing blood flow if you're dilating it you are increasing blood flow so this is manipulated by various factors, which we'll discuss uh, uh, very quick, very soon. Uh, this is the mainstay of changing blood pressure, uh, blood flow to organs uh, in the short term. However, in the long term, which basically spans from minutes to uh, hours to days, weeks, and months, uh, there is something else going on uh, because look, Vasoconstriction and dilation, i.e. manipulating the diameter of a vessel. This is uh, a quick fix, okay? Uh, this, is an, uh, this is a quick manipulation, uh, uh, quick fix, and it does have a limitation. So you can't have a perpetual vasoconstriction or a vasodilation. Some things, something gives, and then these things are reversed. So these are, uh, these are acute em emergency mechanisms which come into play immediately. They're extremely important. However, they, they have limited long-term uh, effectiveness. In the long term, you would like to think about infrastructure. You would like to think
think about increasing the physical size of the vessels and very importantly the number of the vessels you would like to have more vessels collaterals they are called and so on and so forth or maybe change the size of the of the existing vessel so that uh, it it uh, it can fit to the uh, new reality of of this of this organ so these are the local factors uh, as a as a timeline continuum uh, then there are overarching nervous and hormonal mechanisms. So if you, uh, the top of the line is the sympathetic nervous system. And we know how what it, this does, generally speaking. It vasoconstricts or dilates depending on the receptor. So if it's uh, alpha 1 receptor, it will vasoconstrict. If it's beta, it will vasodilate. And this is not epinephrine we're talking about. Uh, and then there are hormones, histamine, bradykinin, and prostaglandins. You must have heard this uh, many, many times before. These are basically, some of them are uh, vasodilators and some of them are vasoconstrictors. So hormones basically are also divided into vasoconstrictors and vasodilators and they have uh, a, a, an effect on the tissue. However, let me just announce here that the local, the local mechanisms take precedence when we are talking about uh, various organs, various local tissues. So what are the acute mechanisms? Let's, let's talk about this. Okay, so talk, we were talking about acute mechanisms. And in acute mechanisms, uh, we, 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 re, we study three mechanisms. Autoregulation, active hyperemia, and reactive hyperemia. Now, I would like to uh, give a word of caution here. Uh, uh, this is not exactly the sequence of uh, your textbook, uh, Guyton. Uh, I have changed it uh, so that it's more uh, student learner oriented. So with that caution, let's proceed. So once again, acute mechanisms are three, autoregulation, active and reactive, hyperemia. Now I understand that these two you may have already uh, studied to some extent uh, in your uh, high school. We'll start with uh, autoregulation. So basically, as the name itself indicates, there are various uh, organs which are very famous for regulating their own blood flow. So they don't really need uh, a lot of external nervous system or hormonal uh, input. They are just sort of master of their own blood flow destiny and they, and they do a pretty good job. So if you check this out, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice graph showing you autoregulation. Uh, uh, we increase the mean arterial pressure, which is like the feeding pressure uh, to whatever organ and, and check out how the blood flow change. So as soon as it hit around 50, right up to 200 or a bit more, look at the graph and look at the acute red graph first. Okay, we'll talk about the green dotted one later. So look at this. When the pressure was increasing uh, below 50, blood flow to the tissue was increasing as well. Okay, but as soon as uh, the mean arterial pressure hit 50, the curve sort of flattens right up to an extremely high value of around about 200 ish mmHg. Now, it's not a flat curve, but it's relatively flat if you compare it with this part and certainly this part okay so this is autoregulation this part here so you are increasing the art mean arterial pressure i.e the feeding arteries you are increasing the pressure in the feeding arteries the big arteries or even the medium arteries however beyond the uh, meta arteriole there is something which is resisting into transmitting this pressure in this huge range to cause any significant increases in blood flow. This is brilliant. And this is what autoregulation is. Uh, kidneys, brain, heart, skeletal muscle, they all uh, exhibit uh, uh, autoregulation, especially the kidneys and the brain. The heart as well, yes. Okay. Uh, look at the green dotted line now. It shows you the same autoregulation phenomena, but it's much more uh, accurate, efficient uh, on the dot. So the blood flow uh, does increase 
uh, as uh, uh, it does in acute change in uh, mean arterial pressure. However, the autoregulation bit, the, 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 stop, the stopping of increasing of the blood flow really is enhanced uh, in the long term. What we mean basically by acute and long term is if the acute uh, increase in blood pressure was, la was later on sorted out and now the blood pressure has dropped back to its original situation and this whole acute thing lasted uh, seconds or minutes or maybe some hours and then everything came back to normal. Okay, that's acute. Uh, however, long term here means that the blood pressure fluctuation uh, was spread out over months to years maybe. Uh, so that is the context of this graph and that is how it's important. And you can imagine that blood flow uh, in the long-term scenario is much more stable, uh, which, which, which shows you the resilience of uh, uh, the, the autoregulation mechanisms in, in these very crucial uh, tissues. Then we move on to active and, and reactive hyperemia. Now, I, I'm, I have an impression that you have studied this in your, under, uh, in your high school. Uh, so let, let's, let me just compare these two. Active uh, hyperemia is basically increased uh, blood flow to, the, to a tissue in response to its metabolic activity. If you increase the metabolic activity, there will be increase in blood flow. If you normalize it, the blood flow will go back to normal. This is called active hyperemia. Now, what is reactive hyperemia uh, in comparison to active hyperemia? Reactive hyperemia is uh, if you stop or if you decrease blood flow to, uh, to, a, to an organ, to a tissue, uh, it will use up, the tissue obviously is alive and it's kicking and it's, uh, it's metabolically active. It will, it will use up all the nutrients and oxygen which is available locally already in the tissue. And then... Uh, there will be a, a, a debt of nutrients and oxygen that it will incur because you're not letting the normal blood to flow in, 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 uh, to this tissue. So depending on the amount of time, the length of time that you have occluded the blood supply to this uh, tissue, the debt will increase naturally. It's a logical thing. And now when you release the occlusion, the blood flow will be such that it will not only have to address the debt of oxygen and nutrients, but uh, it will keep on adding blood uh, to the tissue till it addresses the debt and, till, uh, and, and then starts to supply the blood to this tissue uh, uh, at, a, at a higher rate. And this will happen for, us for some time and then it will come down uh, to the normal level. So it compensates for the occlusion that you uh, you did, uh, and after a while, it then naturally comes down to basal level. A small way of uh, understanding reactive hyperemia is if you use your right hand uh, to uh, to to press hard on your left hand at the wrist. If you do that, you just compress your wrist, your left wrist, with your right hand for a few seconds and then release it. When you release it, basically, feel what happens. You will feel that there is warmth coming in in your otherwise slightly colder hand when you were compressing it. This warmth is basically, re under reactive hyperemia, the blood flow is now gushing into the, uh, the hand, uh, addressing what uh, needed addressing in terms of oxygen debt and nutrient debt during the occlusion. And after a while, you will stop feeling the warmth because the thing has now, the blood flow has now settled the matter and everything has gone back to normal. It's a small uh, way of describing reactive hyperemia. Now let's look at these uh, very rather simple graphs. Uh, this is, uh, let's see the active hyperemia first. Uh, at zero time, you started stimulating a muscle. Uh, when, it, when you started stimulating it, the, bl bl the blood flow increased, okay, naturally, because the metabolic products caused vasodilation, and it started to increase blood flow by vasodilation 
vasodilating the arterioles and you kept on stimulating it for two seconds right at two seconds this whole slope of the graph basically is active hyperemia and at the stoppage of uh, the stimulation the blood flow uh, not very sharply but uh, rather acutely does come down and hits the basic basal level which it was at uh, initially before the stimulation okay now um, reactive hyperemia is, is interesting so you occlude the artery you so this this is normal blood flow you occlude it at zero second so it stays occluded for two seconds which is the opposite of what you did for active hyperemia and as soon as you released it check out the blood flow it really goes up 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 stays there for a while pays all its debts and then it comes down naturally and then it hits uh, the normal blood flow pattern okay so this is the difference between active and reactive hyperemia uh, just a quick note before i actually give you an example of reactive hyperemia this is not just a concept an academic concept it actually has a very important clinical consequence but just before i do that uh, remember the vasodilatory theory which i which we mentioned so when you occluded your left wrist uh, to st stop or uh, decrease the blood supply to your left hand what what happened in the left hand during that time so when these metabolic products they started accumulating they are vasodilators right so let's say it like this that the balance between vasoconstrictors and vasodilators tilted towards the vasodilators yes but the vasodilators couldn't do anything i mean what are they going to do you have occluded physically you have occluded the feeding vessels so even if there is dilation of the vessel uh, there is mechanical compression of the arterio so vasodilators cannot really express themselves right now as soon as you remove the constricting stimulus the vasodilators which already have really increased during the occlusion time in the affected tissue now they have they will express themselves and now they will have a significant vasodilation sudden vasodilation so that the graph really peaks uh, very quickly uh, uh, raising the blood flow uh, uh, appropriately so that everything is done so i just wanted to mention this vasodilatory theory how it's applied to reactive hyperemia uh, and now the the example so coronaries you know coronary supply myocardium the heart muscle right so you also know that during systole uh, there is maybe you don't know okay now you'll know because we'll, we'll be studying this tomorrow by the way anyway uh, so a very quick uh, glimpse into that a uh, coronary blood flow during uh, heart systole drops it's during diastole that coronary blood flow actually takes place nicely and properly this might be a news flash for you once again during systole of the heart the coronaries the, the blood flow in the coronaries drop why do they drop we will discuss it tomorrow but very quick point here is just to explain is the coronaries are part uh, are structurally a uh, structurally a part of the myocardium so the when the myocardium goes into contraction it compresses the vessels when it compresses the vessels so naturally the blood flow will decrease this is a structural uh, point of the heart uh, blood supply okay and it's only when the myocardium relaxes is when you have proper blood flow through the coronaries now where does reactive hyperemia fit in this do you have compression of the coronaries in in uh, in one segment of uh, the cardiac cycle namely systole and when it gets released you have flow in the coronaries connect the dots so occlusion during systole is that occlusion of the left wrist that you that you did yes and when you released it there was increased blood flow to compensate for whatever happened in, during uh, occlusion. This is what happens during cardiac diastole when the myocardium releases its pressure on the uh, coron uh, coronaries. 
what happens is there is increased blood flow uh, than would have uh, happened normally in the coronaries. Okay, now you understand that reactive hyperemia is actually a very important mechanism uh, in coronary blood flow. So we've done the acute mechanisms. Now let's hop on to the long-term ones. And here you go. You have the, the that graph shown again. Uh, look at the red and the green lines. Okay, and this is basically uh, uh, basically to show you now uh, the way the green line has been plotted in this graph. So any increases in mean arterial pressure over longer duration of time will have uh, these long-term mechanisms come into play, which really bring keep the blood flow to the minimum. Any increases will be shunt uh, will be shunned, even though you are really increasing the feeding pressure, the mean arterial pressure. So how come this is achieved? Clearly, acute mechanisms, which we have discussed up till now, do provide you immunity, but to a certain point. And then if you, if you keep on increasing blood pressure, the blood flow will start increasing, which is catastrophic really. But uh, Alhamdulillah, what happens in long-term mechanisms, what happens is, uh, the the curve is flattened even during the long term. So what could possibly happen in the long term, which gets us this very marvelous result? Well, a couple of things actually. Number one is angiogenesis. Angiogenesis, as the name indicates, is formation of new vessels. Okay, you see that this is uh, yes, it's a Guyton diagram, and this is a skeletal muscle of uh, a rat, I believe, and this is a normal picture of the muscle, and these white beads are the blood vessels, and then they stimulated the muscle at a specific rate over months, and see how the white beads have increased. So this is angiogenesis. Also to note is the size of the of the muscle fibers has actually decreased. So there's decrease of uh, diameter of the muscle fiber increase angiogenesis basically the surface air, uh, surface area ratio of vessel to its supplying mass is really improved for better circulation and to make it more leaner and meaner as they say in slang and uh, how is this vascularity changed uh, a key role is oxygen uh, then there are uh, various endothelial drive growth factors the egf is one uh, fibroblast growth factor and geogenin all of this uh, you can uh, read in your books they are pro angiogenesis uh, and then there is uh, 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 this this is an important principle that vascularity uh, basically is determined by uh, the number of times the maximum blood flow had to be achieved to address the metabolic profile of the tissue okay not the average so a blood a, a, a muscle of a bodybuilder uh, it really peaked in its blood flow requirement in, in its uh, metabolic requirements during one of his exercise routines okay so now the body will calculate that okay this this guy uh, his muscles uh, have this upper end of this uh, metabolic uh, requirement of the muscle so the vascularity will then increase in those muscles, keeping in view that peak and not his average during the day when he would go about his normal business. Okay, this is an important point. Uh, there are limitations in the sense that the new vessels, I beg your pardon, uh, the new vessels are, they don't function as the normal, quote unquote, genuine vessels. Uh, they generally are dormant, vasoconstricted, then only uh, yani they may not give you a lot of backup uh, during uh, rest. However, when the body goes into a, an exercise or increased metabolic profile, then these, uh, these new vessels come into play, they dilate and they provide you the backup. And the word is backup really. They uh, are together with the existing vasculature, they fill, fill up the gaps uh, for blood flow. Here I would like to mention, reiterate the role of oxygen that is played in angiogenesis. It's uh, 
it's a very interesting thing in uh, in neonates who uh, are born prematurely they have to be kept under uh, artificial oxygen when they're born right so what has been observed and it's very interesting and Guyton details it is during that time uh, uh, during which they have to be given uh, supplemental oxygen their vessels the growth of their vessels really drops okay because you are supplying uh, adequate oxygen so it really for angiogenesis and especially this is a fetus now so everything needs to first develop so if you supply it with uh, enough or a bit more of oxygen the body will not feel the need for making new vessels how's that so this this little guy his vessels will stop growing if there is too much oxygen given over a longer period of time so if if uh, allah forbid he is in distress respiratory distress and you have to keep him there there is a cost that you incur uh, in terms of the angiogenesis that in his case is the 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 original angiogenesis which needs to take place part of the normal development right so much so that sometimes what happens uh, uh, is when you take them out of this uh, artificial oxygen environment uh, there is an explosion of angiogenesis you would think that's a good a good thing right not if you are in sitting in the eye in the eye the retinal vessels really start to sprout to the extent that they even come onto the cornea causing blindness okay uh, causing blindness now this is uh, just to uh, signify the role oxygen plays a uh, lack of oxygen plays so coming back to normal life if you increase uh, if you start to exercise the muscles concerned muscles with the exercise will have increased oxygen demand because the existing oxygen profile is not enough now this increase of oxygen demand will dictate angiogenesis. Basic, this is the concept. Okay. Formation of collaterals, as the name indicates, uh, if there is a blockage uh, of a vessel, uh, collaterals would develop, which bypass the, collat uh, the, the blockage. Uh, these new vessels can form within minutes to hours, and they continue to grow and multiply in the coming weeks. Uh, these are collaterals. Uh, not as good as the main artery, but uh, they, if they, if they are allowed to grow and multiply enough, uh, uh, they can provide a a decent enough uh, backup to the to the tissue, uh, such that no great uh, problem or damage uh, happens uh, by the by blocking or semi blocking of the feeding vessel. This whole thing comes to come to focus. Uh, in uh, coronary artery disease, uh, in which the the, the the atherosclerotic plaque now has pouched into the lumen and has actually blocked it. So if there's a coronary and it's blocked, you can imagine what would happen. Uh, and check this out. It's a very interesting detail. In most of us, alhamdulillah, what happens is during our time, we do uh, have this atherosclerosis going on since our teens. Okay. In your case, you are a teenager probably. I'm talking about myself here. So uh, this atherosclerosis has been going on for a while. And depending on your diet, etc., etc., uh, the rate of atherosclerosis varies. Now, generally speaking, people who it don't end up having a heart attack or any significant heart event, what happens is there is atherosclerosis. There are thrombi that form, which semi or not completely occlude, but sort of half occlude a vessel affecting the coronary blood flow to the uh, to, to wherever uh, with whichever area of myocardium they're supplying and this causes decrease in oxygen tension and all that and causes the sprouting of collaterals so while the guy is going through his life normal routine uh, he or she does not even know notice that collaterals are actually sprouting out bypassing these uh, 
these blockages all the time like okay and they they connect the pre block part of the artery with the post block uh, part of the artery uh, quite literally bypassing the blockage so that the blood flow to the to the wherever this artery was going is going is not compromised so this is very interesting uh, collaterals are formed in normal people in all the people actually if you exercise routinely guess what you increase these collaterals that's why people say people are asked to exercise routinely okay the more exercise they do even if they were to do a 30 minute brisk walk um, every day this person would have enough collaterals that if he behaves in his diet does not smoke and has doesn't have a very uh, wicked family history for heart disease he may never have cardiac symptoms even though there will be thrombi there will be occlusions in his coronaries but there'll be enough collaterals that this guy will be okay okay uh, just to mention honorary mention of uh, uh, the hormonal uh, side of things there are vasoconstrictor agents as we mentioned vasodilators as we mentioned there are different ions and agents which, which cause vasoconstriction and vasodilation you can go through this list and read your uh, the relevant section of uh, your textbook to have a view of this uh, this is a nice diagram which basically uh, sort of summarizes what we have discussed in vasoconstriction uh, and vasodilation